So now we go on and I think it's uh, my pleasure that last but not least, I would like to welcome Nicole, Nicole Bigler and, and Luca, who uh, will provide us um, the Japanese experience, uh, the experiences from the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Jörg. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you very yeah, well. Excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the colleagues uh, for having me here, me and Nicole. Thank you, of course, to all the attendees. I can see that there are a lot of you uh, still with us after more than one hour, so thanks much. Uh, here in, uh, in Tokyo is 6.48 p.m., uh, so almost the end of the day. Uh, I will not steal too much time from Nicole that is actually going to talk about uh, a case from a recent past. Uh, so I just want to uh, introduce very briefly the services of the help desk that maybe are not that known, especially to all of you, uh, all of those that are in Europe. Uh, so maybe the next slide I can. Um, perfect. Okay. So the help desk is a, a service of the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation, which is a joint venture between the European Commission and METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Investment here in Japan. So the good thing for the help desk is that being within uh, a bigger structure, which is uh, whose purpose is to help SMEs uh, come to Japan from Europe and from Japan going to Europe, uh, is actually pretty good because, as I will explain in uh, in a second, uh, you can benefit from very different services, not just IP related services. But speaking about the help desk, as you can see here in the slide. Uh, the target audience is COSME related uh, and Japanese companies, so companies, individuals, research centers, universities that are based in a COSME country or in Japan. And the objective, of course, is to understand all the mechanics about IP, how to uh, understand uh, and uh, perform a technology transfer deal, learn more about IP, and in general, uh, also matchmaking activities. We have a separate website from the one of the center, which is here uh, on the slide eu-jp-tthelpdesk.eu, uh, 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 where you can find a lot of interesting materials that I will show you in, uh, in the next slide. So please, if I can see, thank you. Um, we have, uh, we decided to, uh, let's say, follow the so-called pull and push approach. So in the, on the push side, we help universities and research centers promote their technologies and they can be uploaded on the website. It's very easy, as a, you can see here, it literally takes five minutes. If you go on the homepage, there is a section called uh, Submit Your Technology. Of course, if you want to be in touch with me, you can, you can do so. You can send me an email, we can talk, and then you can decide to upload as a technology manager uh, your technology from the university or the research center. We will also create a section for you for the institution for the logo and everything. So your institution, as long as there is one uh, technology that is available, we'll have a page and a section on the website. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, opposite side of the, the push is the pull, as you may know. Uh, so we help companies uh, in trying to get in touch with researchers and with universities and research centers to find technologies or skills uh, in research areas that uh, need for the companies some, uh, some help. So constantly we publish our own request for proposal or we republish a uh, request for proposal from partners that are constantly seeking for help. And uh, so you can see on the uh, section of the website dedicated to this, that there are some deadlines that they say uh, each request for proposal, all the details, how you have to apply, what are the requirements for the, uh, the proposal in terms of length, language, documents, et cetera. So everything is there. But again, if you have a question, I'm here uh, to, to answer all the questions you might have. Next slide, please. Yes, so we have really a lot of resources and the center has different services. So there are different websites where you can get uh, more information. If you go on the general website of the center, which is www.eu-japan.eu, you can find all the information about all the different help desks because we run several of them. Uh, and from there, you can go to the uh, different websites. On my website, you can find information about the past webinars, seminars that we had, of course, physically here in Tokyo, uh, reportage of the events that uh, the team uh, has attended here in mostly in Japan, 
fact sheets that we prepare with uh, partner law firms and IP firms, mostly here in Japan, and also podcasts. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, this uh, brings me now to uh, the moment which I have to introduce you to Nicole. Nicole is a member of Sonoden Kobayashi, which is a leading IP firm in, uh, in Japan and Tokyo. And um, we have been working as a help desk uh, now for maybe three or four years with Sonoden Kobayashi. They helped us in many different ways in uh, creating this uh, so-called IPR support program, which allows companies and individuals to be in touch with us for uh, a pro bono uh, IPR support program, which means you can have a conversation with a patent attorney. And then of course you will know whether or not uh, it's possible for you to maybe file an application here in Japan, where are the different routes, how much time it takes, costs of course, and everything of course is confidential and you don't have to, uh, you're not committed. So of course, if you don't want to move on, uh, you're free to do so. Um, Last but not least, we have a lot of uh, a social media network channels. So we have a LinkedIn page, Facebook page, Twitter, of course. So I would like you to start following us if you don't do it yet, especially from, from, your, from Europe. And uh, again, here you can see my contact details. Feel free to be in touch. You can also find my uh, email on the website. But if you want to take a note here for a second, please do uh, take a note and remember my email if you want to be in touch. Uh, I'm done for today. I would love to introduce you so to Nicole Bigler uh, from Sonoden Kobayashi. She will talk uh, about a case of the recent past. Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's nice to meet all of you. And thank you very much for having me. As Luca mentioned, I'm with Sonoden Kobayashi IP Law. Uh, we are a boutique IP firm based in Tokyo and in Beijing. And we are specialized in helping companies protecting their intellectual property rights in Japan and in China. So um, that's enough about us. Could you please go to the next slide? Thank you very much. So today I would like to introduce to you a case on a rather bigger scale. Um, both companies involved, Honeywell, a US-based company, and Arkema, a France-based company, are multinational entities. And the dispute I'm going to explain is not only happening in Japan, but on a global level. The reason I have picked this case is that it involves an important green technology and both parties can be said to be acting in the name of environmental protection. I would like to show you what happened to their IP rights in Japan specifically. First, a little bit background, however. So before the mid 2000s, automobile manufacturers used a re refrigerant called HSC 134A for automobile air conditioners. This gas had been used for coolant, but it was known to create ozone holes in the atmosphere and many governments became alert about the gas considering it to be bad. In 2003, however, and onwards, um, Honeywell started filing patent applications on the use of HFO 1234YF, an automobile air conditioning known to be less harmful to the environment. In 2006, global warming concerns prompted the European Union to enact new regulations regarding automobile to use refrigerants with low global warming potential. The regulations apply to all new automobile platforms beginning in 2013 and to all new automobiles by 2017. Therefore, automobile manufacturers in developed countries have transitioned their technical standards to 1234YF, which has a low global warming potential. Both Arkema and Honeywell wish to supply the industry with 1234YF, and both have invested substantial resources in the production of 1234YF. Honeywell established a global patent portfolio, which is challenged by Arkema for novelty and inventive step in many different jurisdictions. The dispute resulting from this competition was fought between Honeywell and Arkema, predominantly in Europe and the US, but also other jurisdictions jurisdictions played an important role. Next slide, please. On this slide, uh, you can see a table with 10 patents granted on the use of HFO 1234YF that have been granted in the United States, Japan, 
and uh, by the European Patent Office. These 10 patents appear to be most relevant to the use of pure 1234YF as the refrigerant in auto air conditioning. Divisional patent applications are not considered here, even though in reality they also play an important role. Honeywell also filed patent applications in other jurisdictions like India and China, but today I'm not going to focus on these. All the patents you see here on this list uh, filed in the US were challenged uh, sooner or later by Arkema, and the battle is still ongoing nowadays. All the European patents filed here were challenged too, and all of them were revoked one after the other, the last one in 2020. In my presentation, I'm going to focus on the two Japanese patents to the right. Next slide, please. please. <clears throat> in the long history of this battle, the two companies have used several tools to challenge each other, as well as other competitors. As already mentioned, numerous patent disputes were filed. It started all in 2009 when Honeywell and Arkema in Germany, when, when Honeywell sued Arkema in Germany for infringement of a European patent. During the years that followed, both players made claims and counterclaims against each other's patents in the US and Europe. Every patent listed on the previous slide was sooner or later challenged by either Arkema or another company. In addition to all the patent disputes, several antitrust investigations have been filed. For example, Arkema accused Honeywell of hindered competition on the market of HFO 1234YF. By refusing to grant licenses, it said the use player is harming consumers, automobile manufacturers, and the environment by monopolizing a market they actually cannot fully supply themselves. There have been also some other challenges made by other competitors. For example, there has been a safety challenge made um, under the leadership of Daimler in Germany. And also quite recently, uh, Honeywell is still together with the customs confiscating shipments from Chinese companies of uh, one, two, three, four YF deliveries into Europe. Uh, there was a case in the Czech Republic in 2018 and one in Poland in 2019 where uh, shipments were confiscated and that later patent infringement lawsuits were filed. Next slide, please. So now let's look a little bit more in detail of what happened in Japan to these two patents that were filed by Honeywell. The first patent was filed in 2005. Um, the patent coverage was a heat transfer composition comprising a component described in a chemical formula in the in the patent along with a polyol ester or polyalkaline glycol lubricant. During the prosecution already, a third party or several third parties investigated the dossier. This is already a sign that there might be some adversarial proceeding coming up. Finally, the patent was granted in March 2011. It was in a very short period of time, three separate nullity actions these are trials for invalidation in Japan were filed by three different parties. One was of course filed by Arkema. The other two were filed by two Japanese companies, one by Daikin Industries and the other one by AGC, which used to be known as Asahi Glass. The Tokyo District Court issued decisions on all three nullity actions in May, 2013 and claim one to eight which were the relevant claims to cover the product were all invalidated. Honeywell appealed to the IP High Court on these decisions, um, but all decisions were upheld in 2014. Honeywell then tried to appeal to the Supreme Court in Japan, but the Supreme Court decided not to hear the case. The decision to invalidate patent was finalized 2015 in April, and since no further appeals are possible, the decision is herewith finalized. To the next slide, please. Something quite similar happened to the other patent of Honeywell filed in Japan. This one was filed in 2006, and the patent covered use as a refrigerant of a constituent containing tetrafluoropropane which is HF1234 in air conditioner of an automobile. Here again, um, there was a lot of inspection during the, the prosecution of the case. Uh, the case was granted in 2010 and soon afterwards, again, three nullity actions were filed. 
One nullity action was filed by Daikin Industry and later joined by Arkema. One by Arkema, later joined by Daikin Industry. So these two companies, French and Japanese, started to act together against Honeywell. The third nullity action was filed by Asahi Glass, but later withdrawn because Asahi Glass made an agreement with Honeywell. So they dropped out. Nevertheless, the Tokyo District Court um, issued a decision in 2015 and invalidated the full patent. Honeywell again appealed to the IP High Court, but the decision was upheld in 2017. Then Honeywell tried to appeal to the Supreme Court, but the case again was not heard. So the decision was finalized in 2018. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the decision in a little bit more detail. For both patents, the issue was whether the inventive step requirement was fulfilled or not. There were two problems, whether the invention can claim inventiveness or not. Number one, 1234YF was already described in a prior art among about a dozen other compounds. And problem number two, the prior art start stated 1234YF is actually a good refrigerant. Honeywell, however, had argued, yes, it is known as a refrigerant, but not for air conditioners for automobiles, which are different from air conditioners in general. The judges, however, decided in both cases that air conditioning in automobiles is not so different and therefore the invention lacks inventiveness. Also, worth to mention is that despite a potentially social impact related topic, Supreme Court decided not to hear either case. This is because the Supreme Court in Japan cares about legal interpretation of the law, but only rarely social impact related cases, which include environmental related topics. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons learned from that? First of all, um, both parties can claim the position of the environmental friendly party. Honeywell for providing a product helping in the conservation of the environment and Arkema for stopping Honeywell from monopolizing a market relevant to the conversation, conservation of the environment and preventing unreasonable profit under the catchword of global environment. Number two, the Japanese patent system is neutral because it does not care whether the patentee is a good guy or a bad guy or whether the invention was made on a good will or not. Number three, the Japanese patent system simply asks whether the invention has novelty and inventive steps and whether it fulfills other requirements to get a patent in Japan. And number four, with the current examination standards, social impact or environmental impact is not considered when the JPU decides whether a patent is valid or not. And this is not a topic the Supreme Court deems important enough to hear. Now, next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Um, we're coming to the end of my presentation and I would like to finish here. I don't want to um, let you go with the feeling that Japan does not care about green technology. That is not the case at all. So the JPO periodically publishes studies on different technology sectors. And in 2016, they did a really small study on uh, green technology patented worldwide and in Japan. So on this graph, the columns that are blue, that's for publications by nationality so of people in Japan. Um, and you can see that uh, by far, companies originating in Japan have filed the most patent applications in the period between 2006 and 2014. 2013-14, uh, Chinese applicants kind of caught up and I think we can imagine that they may have taken over Japan right now. So I don't have any data to prove or disprove that. But still in total over the last 10, 15 years, I think it's fair to say that Japanese companies have filed most applications for green related technologies. So Japan can be a good jurisdiction to search protection for green related technology and you should not feel discouraged to file here a patent or other protection. Okay, um, next slide. That was everything from my side. I'm sorry, I think we got a little bit of overtime. But if you have any questions on IP protection in Japan or in China, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much.